There we go. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Pomeranz, and I'm the director of the Wilson Center's Kennett Institute. I want to thank you all for joining us today to discuss how non-democratic non regimes have used foreign agents' legislation as a tool of repression against dissenters and civil society. Before we begin, I just want to encourage everyone to stay up to date with the latest Kennan Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our blogs, Focus Ukraine and The Russia File, and our Russian language blog, In Other Words. You can also subscribe to uh, our podcast, Kennan X, and The Russian File. To our online audience, if you want to ask questions for our speaker, uh, you can submit questions via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on the Kennan Institute's Facebook page. Uh, I will begin by sp uh, introducing our speaker today. Uh, he is Maxim Krupski, and he is a human rights defender and attorney at law and a PhD in philosophy with more than 12 years experience of practicing law and defending refugees, civil activists, persecuted in the Russian Federation. He is currently the Galina Stervoitova Fellow on Human Rights and Conflict Resolution at the Kennan Institute. Maxime, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm really glad to talk with you today uh, on this topic, foreign agents legislation between democratic resilience and weaponized uh, transparency. So this presentation is uh, a part of my comprehensive research on foreign agents legislation in the context of the weaponization of transparency and its use for political purposes. And the purpose of this study is engage in a comparative analysis of uh, existing foreign agents legislation and subsequent practice based on these laws to determine both their potential as a tool to counter illegitimate interference and their risks from a human rights perspective. Um, today, as you may know, uh, foreign agent legislation and its analogs exist in dozens of countries around the world, including the United States, India, Kazakhstan, Cambodia, Uganda, Israel, Australia, and many others. And similar legislation is currently being developed in the European Union. Two weeks ago, the president of Kyrgyzstan also signed an analog of the law on foreign agents, which is almost a complete copy of uh, the first version from 2012 of the Russian law on foreign agents. And these days, civil protests are taking place in Georgia against the second attempt to adopt the Georgian version of the foreign agents law, which the Georgian opposition also calls a copy of the Russian law. Last year, Georgia already tried to adopt this law and then civil society succeeded in getting the idea rejected. And time will tell what will happen this time. I would like to talk also um, about the role that foreign agents legislation plays today and why democracies see the need for it. And I would also like to pay attention to the challenges that this legislation contains and using Russia as an example to show the risks it can carry. And I propose to look at the Russian experience not as the experience of a rogue country uh, and an uh, exception to the rules, but on the contrary, as a very dangerous precedent of politicized use of transparency legislation, which has already been used as a blueprint in other countries. So um, I would like to start with this short statistic. So research indicates that democracy is in decline around the world today. And for the first time in decades, there are more closed autocracies than liberal democracies. According to the PDAM Institute's latest report, the eighth annual democracy report 2024, democracy winning and losing at the ballot, autocratization remains the dominant trend. Um, so here on this slide you can see uh, some charts provided by the VDAM Institute in this report. And uh, 
In this report also mentioned that the level of democracy enjoyed by the average person in the world in 2023 is down to 1995 levels. By country-based averages, it is back to 1998. Since 2009, almost 15 years in a row, the share of the world's population living in autocratizing countries has overshadowed the share living in democratizing countries. The wave of autocratization is notable and autocratization is going in 42 countries, home to 2.8 billion people of 35% of the world's population. Of course, this is due to both internal, social, political, and economic reasons and external influence, including from autocratic regimes. Activism by non-democratic regimes can take the form of disseminating propaganda, disinformation, corrupting politicians, supporting radical movements, and many, many other forms. For example, the far-right ties to Russia are causing growing concern in Germany. Many fear that the alternative for Germany party is becoming a tool of Russian influence operations, polarizing German society and posing a threat to the democratic regime. Currently, Belgium launched probe into suspected Russian info interference in upcoming EU elections. Last month, Latvia's state security service started criminal proceedings against Latvian EU lawmaker Tatiana Zdanoka over alleged Russian ties. Reports in Russian, Nordic, and Baltic news, news sites in January alleged that she had been an, ag an agent for the Russian Federal Security Service since at least 2004. These and many other examples of the potential threats or real threats posed by non-democratic regimes working to erode democracy are of great concern of the populations of democracies and politicians alike. So democracies are therefore looking for ways to counter these challenges of negative foreign influence, which is quite understandable. And one of the mechanisms for this is transparency legislation and in particular foreign agents legislation and its analogs. A um, recent prominent example of this is the European Commission's Protecting Democracy Package, a draft of which was adopted in December 2023. Central to this package is a legislative proposal that will increase transparency and democratic accountability of representation activities on behalf of third countries, aimed at influencing policy, decision-making, and democratic space. In fact, this um, directive envisages the creation of an umbrella legislation on transparency, followed by the development of relevant national legislation in all countries within the European Union. This initiative is interesting to me, not only because it is probably the most ambitious draft analog of the legislation on foreign agents, but also because the explanatory documents to it clearly describe the reasons that promoted, uh, that prompted, sorry, the developers to work on this document. This initiative is officially presented as a tool to fight authoritarian influence inside the European Union. In particular, uh, the developers of this initiative link the growing risks of authoritarian foreign influence to Russia's activities against the backdrop of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And it can hardly be seriously denied that these concerns uh, are unfounded. And certainly, democratic regimes need to find effective ways to counter the risks of authoritarian influence, including at the legislative level through the development of transparency legislation. However, it is also necessary to be extremely careful and strive to ensure that legislative mechanisms for combating authoritarian influence remain in line with democratic principles. In particular, such legislation must comply with the rule of law and one of its main pillars, legal certainty. Only then, in my view, can one be sure that the principles of equality of all before the law, the right to defense, the right to freedom of assembly and freedom of speech will be respected. And perhaps, this is one of the general weaknesses in foreign agent legislation around the world that legal scholars need to work seriously to address. Because my point is very simple. Legislation on transparency should be transparent in itself. And the draft transparency directive from the European Commission I'm referring to is no exception here. 
On this slide, you can see a proposed definition or description of what constitutes foreign representation activities. As you can see, this definition is extremely vague and it is almost impossible to conclude from it where the line is drawn between the normal or fair independent activities that do not cause harm and foreign interest activities that may harm democracy. In general, it's quite interesting that despite the fact that in all countries of the world, the legislation on foreign agents is officially developed in order to combat a certain foreign threat, uh, it means negative influence. No criteria of damage or negative impact are containing in the very definition of foreign agent activity. In my opinion, this is a rather serious lacuna in the very concept of foreign agents, especially considering that according to public opinion polls, in the same Europe, people are concerned not so much about the fact of foreign influence as about the spread of false or inaccurate information, growing distrust of democratic institutions and propaganda spread by non-democratic actors. Three blue lines um, on this slide. Thus, in my view, in the context of transparency legislation, the focus should be shift from who disseminates information or exerts influence from which country to the content and the nature of the influence. This will allow for a more effective fight against autocratic challenges. And I completely agree with this definition of resilient democracy that I was able to find in one academic article. Um, I think that Democratic resilience is the ability of a political regime to prevent or react to challenges, but without losing its democratic character. And I also believe that we need to be very careful with the legislation on foreign agents and it, at its analogs, so as not to create conditions for the potential development of the radical Russian scenario. So about the Russian scenario is the second part of this presentation. And here, I also would like to start with some actual statistics. And you can see here on this slide, the latest statistics. As you can see on this slide, the number of foreign agents in Russia increased significantly on the eve of the war and has been growing steadily over the last two years. At the same time, in recent years, most of the foreign agents have been natural persons. First of all, those who publicly criticized the war or Putin's regime itself. And this is one of my favorite part of the explanation from right from the Russian Ministry of Justice. Direct quotes. You can see the most frequent reasons for inclusion in the register of foreign agents for the last months. And this is a general trend in Russian legislation on foreign agents since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, these grounds have nothing to do with transparency or protection from foreign influence. This is a clear indication of how legislation officially claimed to ensure transparency is in fact a tool to combat dissenters. However, this application or implementation of the law on foreign agents is possible not simply because of political will, but precisely because the Russian authorities have worked hard to create the relevant legislation that would unleash them to do so. And one of its hallmarks, it is extremely vague wording. In 2022, a new law on control over the activities of persons under foreign influence has been adopted, and it finally destroyed the meaning of the concept of foreign agent in Russia. In this law, the concept of a foreign source, essentially a principle in those interests the agent acts, disappeared completely. And Russian foreign agents, I like to repeat it again and again, Russian foreign agents are a unique phenomenon because there is no such thing anywhere else in the world. You can be an agent of no one without acting in anyone's interests at all. Here, I just, yes, here you can also see the criteria of agency that are defined as broadly as possible. And the Russian authorities have ensured themselves a maximum degree of discretion. 
decisions on inclusion in the register are made today in an arbitrary form, arbitrary manner. So I skip two or three slides and want to say that the status of foreign agent is not neutral, especially in Russian legislation, and it is truly discriminatory. Here are just a few examples of the restrictions faced by foreign agents. But again, uh, it's just the text of the law. And it's really important to see how it works in practice. I like these slides. So on this slide, you can see what enforcement of the foreign agents looks uh, like in practice. These are screenshots of a children's podcast about history. The author of the podcast, historian Tamara Edelman, is on the register on foreign agents. So she can't talk to children about Mesopotamia anymore. And this podcast is now labeled 18 plus as an adult movie. Uh, this seems funny only at first glance because, for example, teachers or tutors, authors of educational projects for children who may be recognized as foreign agents will simply lose their jobs if they are less lucky than Tamara Edelman, who has a loyal audience and popularity. This how foreign agent books looks like, looked like in bookstores last year. Note that some stores decided to reinsure themselves and double label the foreign agent book. This is what self-censorship and stigmatization looks like, not on paper, but in reality. This is one of the most recent examples of stigmatization. Applicants to a bachelor's program in journalism are forbidden to mention foreign agents during the admission process, because this can lead to canceled interview results. Another one example. Exclusion of Yulia Sinyoka, Russian philosopher, doctor of philosophy, corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, from the list of those awarded the Jubilee Medal because she had been included in the register of foreign agents. This is the official letter, as you can see, from the Russian Academy of Sciences. And the last example, one of the most recent examples, uh, so this is a uh, door sign on the office of St. Petersburg deputy Boris Vishnevsky. And this door sign was forcibly changed after he was included in the register of foreign agents. So the Russian authorities are constantly tightening legislation on foreign agents, and it has recently become known about the emergence of a number of new discriminatory initiatives directed against foreign agents. Currently, the State Duma of the Russian Federation is discussing the introduction of a ban on deductions to foreign agents for copyright and related rights. This initiative is obviously aimed at worsening the financial situation of foreign agents, primarily musicians, artists, and writers, and in essence is an attempt to legalize the taking away of their legally earned money as a punishment for political disloyalty. Guided by similar considerations, the Parliament of Bashkiria, one of the Russian's republics, proposed to prohibit foreign agents from receiving more than minimum wage, about 200 bucks, from transactions, with the remainder going to the budget. One of the latest initiatives was a proposal by a group of deputies of the Russian State Duma to restrict access to books by writers who are foreign agents in libraries in order to prevent propaganda of authors, quote, whose activities are directed against the security of the Russian Federation. And it's really important to mention a new trend has uh, recently emerged in the actions of the legislature. The development of legal norms providing for liability for certain forms of interaction with foreign agents and aimed at disciplining Russian society in the manner of their active discrimination. To date, this has found expression in two new legislative initiatives. The first law, which came into effect as early as last year, provides for liability for individuals and legal entities for assisting foreign agents in violating the prohibitions of the law. For example, Russian schools, children's educational centers, and creative workshops should now carefully screen all of their current and potential teachers for foreign agent status if they want to avoid the risk of prosecution under the new law, since foreign agents in Russia are prohibited from carrying out educational and pedago pedagogical activities with minors, as well as creating information products for them. 
Having identified a foreign agent among their staff, they will have to dismiss them. The second notorious law, which provides for a complete ban on advertising of foreign agent resources and advertising on their information platforms, social media accounts, channels, websites, etc., has already had a serious negative effect on them, calling into question the continued existence of a number of independent media projects. In addition to the obvious legal consequences in the form of administrative and criminal liability for violating the established restrictions of the law, on adver um, advertising ban just a few weeks after its entry into force has led to a real wave of self-censorship among advertisers which further discriminates against foreign agents. Some advertising agencies and brands are already introducing additional bans and requirements against them, wanting to protect themselves. For example, they refuse to sign contracts with foreign agents and demand to remove from their information materials even those advertising integrations that were made before the law came into force. According to Vyacheslav Valodin, the speaker of the State Doom of the Russian Federation, one of the ideologists of property repression against foreign agents, thanks to the law on the ban on advertising, um, they will have to lose up to 80% of their advertising revenues. So what I think is very important to mention that the Russian law on foreign agents obviously violates the right to freedom of assembly, the principle of equality of fall before the law and before the court, the right to defense, because it's impossible to defend oneself when there are no clear criteria mentioned in the law for being labeled as a foreign agent, the defense simply has nothing to rely on. Finally, this law is simply unconstitutional. But more importantly, this law is simulacrum. I think this term is very important to use and to understand because, in fact, by using the law on foreign agents, the Russian government does not identify foreign agents and does not make their activities transparent. But in fact, Russian government artificially creates foreign agents and just try to, repl to replace the real state of affairs with a constructed reality which they can use in its own authoritarian purposes. Um, I think that uh, Russian law is a prime example of weaponized transparency. Of course, uh, we should not think that the Russian scenario will happen tomorrow in democratic countries. Uh, however, uh, I believe that we should remember that the erosion of democracy also happens slowly and gradually. And guided by the example of Russia, we should always remember the dangers of sloppy handling of the legislation on foreign agents and its analogs and how easy it is to take the path of weaponization of transparency. The Russian experience is obviously openly discriminatory. However, if we look beyond the aggressive rhetoric, we see that the Russian law is merely a radicalization of analogs of foreign agents legislation in other countries. Um, I should mention that, of course, the Putin, Putin's regime is deliberately exploiting the gaps and weaknesses of this legislation for its own political purposes. And the task of my research uh, is to understand what are the fundamental weaknesses, fundamental issues with this legislation, and using, among other things, the authoritarian Russian experience to develop proposals to minimize the risks of this legislation, um, the Russian scenario in other countries. And uh, I, I think that it's very important to, um, to remember and to take into account, especially against the backdrop of the general autocratization I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, and the recent foreign agent uh, initiatives in Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and also in Republika Serbska in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I think I stop here, and thank you.
Thank you, Maxime. I just want to uh, basically talk about how you can ask questions online for Maxime. Uh, if you have a question, you can submit the questions via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Kennan Institute's Facebook page. So I want to begin with a question of when Vladimir Putin always talks about foreign agents law, he clarifies that the United States has had a long history of foreign agents law, uh, although they are very dissimilar. So just to kind of analyze the differences between the elements of Russia and the US foreign, uh, foreign agent law and why it is not a good analog for, um, for this legislation. Okay, uh, thank you so much for, for this question. I think uh, it's, uh, it is very simple because at least in, in the FARA law, uh, here in the United States, you have uh, a uh, figure of the principle and clear, more or less clear, the uh, construction of the interaction between agents and the principle. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, very important part of the very concept of foreign agent or any other agent activity is a figure of, of principle in whose interests agent acts. In Russia, in Russian law, uh, throughout the whole history of this legislation, uh, there is no such person, and there is no need for Russian executive authorities, judicial authorities, provide some evidence uh, about uh, the uh, agency activity at all. So this is the main, the main difference between uh, these two. Uh, legal acts. And in, again, I want to repeat this very simple idea that Russian law is simulacrum. It's not about agency activity at all. Of course, uh, the FARA law also is uh, very vague and it has uh, a lot of problems with definitions and so on and so forth, but at least here we can understand the very concept, the very idea of agency activity and the second very important difference is that you don't use here, through the implementation of this law, you don't use aggressive, discriminating uh, rhetoric towards foreign agents. And third thing, it's in the more general sense, in the United States, there is a independent judicial system uh, which can control the activity of the executive authorities and can protect persons and legal entities from uh, wrong implementation of this, of this legal act. So we'll turn to the audience in one, in one second, but I have one other question to deal with, and that is who actually brings the charge of a foreign agent? My understanding is that it's the prosecutor's office. Ministry of Justice. Ministry of Justice, okay. Ministry of Justice. The Ministry of Justice brings it, okay. Includes um, everyone in this in this list each Friday, almost each Friday. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, foreign agent day in Russia. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> but this is this is uh, this is the reality. Yeah. yeah. And is there is there any source of appeal? Ye of well, uh, technically speaking, technically, yes. technically, <laughs> technically speaking, of course you you can submit an appeal uh, to the courts, but uh, in fact throughout the whole history of the implementation of this legislation from 2012 until now, there were only two uh, positive uh, judgments uh, and uh, all, I mean, both of these judgments were uh, uh, withdrawn by the, the next um, inst instances. Um, so, two, on, only two positive positive judgments um, uh, were in, in, in the process of the implementation. The first one was my case with uh, one of my clients, uh, the uh, NGO from uh, Saint Petersburg, um, uh, wor uh, which is working with uh, HIV positive people, 
this organization was labeled as a uh, foreign agent because of nothing, because of the comments on, uh, for, uh, on, on legislation, um, criminal legislation um, towards say, um, drug users and something else, but without any political context at all. And um, we provided evidence of that this decision is, is illegal. The decision of the Ministry of Justice um, is illegal. Uh, we spent four trials, I think, four trials in appeal instance, three or four hours each, and three judges uh, made 26 pages judgment in our favor. So, but next uh, next instance dismissed this this decision in I think seven minutes or something. Okay, we'll open up questions to our audience. Uh, any questions? Right here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roberta Lajun, and I am a retired Mexican ambassador. There's um, an incredible discussion in the Mexican press about the um, big number of um, Russian diplomatic personnel in the Mexican embassy, in the Russian embassy in Mexico City. Uh, we don't have any legislation and, uh, concerning foreign agents, but it certainly calls the attention the high number of Russian diplomats that is not proportional to the importance of the bilateral relationship. And, um, well, I, I, I'm not sure I have a question mm -hmm. here. What I, I, I just want to say, uh, is it a tradition within the Russians to, I mean, uh, register as diplomats foreign agency, for foreign agents? Um, as far as I know, uh, diplomats cannot be labeled as foreign agents according to the law. So it's not about, because, you know, the, the, the idea, I, I think that the, in, in the United States, more or less the, the, the similar situation, because um, diplomacy is, a, is an official channel of interaction between um, politicians, between states, and so on and so forth. And the, the idea... Um, so it's like their profession, you know, to influence their partners uh, in other, uh, in different, uh, different states. And the idea of the FAR legislation and the foreign agent legislation in general is to make more transparent so-called covered influence. So not official influence, not official channels of, of uh, uh, interaction, diplomatic interaction, for example. But of course... I am sure and I believe that this is the real problem when uh, diplomats from the Russian side or from other authoritarian countries, autocracies, are acting as, you know, some kind of uh, agents of uh, maybe secret services or something like that, and they can, uh, can bring some threats for, uh, for other countries. So I don't know, I don't have any... I don't have any solutions for that because I think that this is not my field of, of uh, expertise. But I think that this is um, maybe a kind of an area of, um, should be an area of concern of secret services or some other, other actors, I mean, uh, in terms of um, providing security and other, um, yeah, other, uh, uh, other mechanisms of protection uh, of uh, sovereignty and, and national security. Right here. Good afternoon, uh, Simon Kirsten. I'm the legal advisor at the Swiss Embassy here in Washington. Following up to the question that Madam Ambassador just asked, um, I, I suppose that um, Russia is still a, a state party to the, diplomat, to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations that grants uh, privileges and immunities. Has Russia used the foreign agent law as a ground to expel foreign diplomats uh, as persona non grata? Um, is that a, a pattern that you can observe? I know there have been many diplomats have been expelled, but was, was that very law the basis of that? Thank you so much for this question. No, no. Uh, they, as far as I know, 
uh, they don't, Russian authorities don't use this legislation against diplomats and official politicians because the idea of the Russian foreign agent law is to label those, um, well, first of all, those Russian citizens and uh, Russian non-governmental organizations as traitors, in fact. So who is foreign agent for the, in, in, in the eyes of the Russian authorities? Uh, traitors, of course. So because they share so-called Western values, you know, so, uh, I mean, the, the, the values, it means the values of uh, the enemies of great holy Russia and so on and so forth. So that's why they use this legislation against, mostly against Russian citizens and Russian non-governmental organizations and not against uh, the uh, foreign diplomats or uh, foreign officials because they have a lot of other mechanisms how to deal with, uh, uh, how to deal with them. Okay. A reminder to our online audience, if you have questions for our speaker, you can submit them via email to Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on the Kennan Institute's Facebook page. Right here. Hi, I'm Arlo Zito, Howard University. Um, I have a question. You started talking about the fact that you're carrying out a comparative analysis, and I was wondering who were you comparing, because the uh, ambassador from Mexico reminds me that I've been following the Spanish sort of s thinkers, and what's going on in Spanish and Latin America is very different from how we're talking about it in the United States and Europe. So I'm wondering, who are you comparing with? And yeah, like, uh, have you had a chance to look at Latin America? Because what they're saying down there is really interesting, and not necessarily in a good way. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, my idea is to collect as much information as possible from different countries, but currently I'm working on collecting um, legal practice and draft laws or actual laws from Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, um, from um, Hungary, from the European Union, I also have some um, connections with experts from African countries, and I am trying to do a kind of networking with experts from uh, Latin America also. Uh, but I think that I should, um, you know, uh, sh should, should divide my, my um, research into several parts because it's impossible, you know, to compare everything from all around the world. So I just, that's why uh, I just want to start with Central Asian region because I think that this is the region of influ Russian influence, first of all, and Russian interests. And as far as we can see, at least on the example of Kyrgyz uh, legislation, this is the literally a copy of the Russian foreign agent law. So I think that it's very interesting to analyze potential you know, connections with this, um, with, with this initiative, with this, uh, this law, and some maybe actors from Russia. I don't know, I don't have such evidence yet, but I think that it's really interesting. And again, to compare not only legal practice and texts of uh, legal acts. Oh, of course, Australia. Yeah, Australia, a very interesting example. Uh, the foreign agent legislation from Australia uh, as a democratic, one of the democratic examples, right, like in the United States. But still, um, I also, I'm, I'm curious how people from civil society uh, react uh, to this, uh, this, this practice. Because I know that there are a lot of concern, uh, th there is a lot of concern in, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, in Kazakhstan, in Georgia, obviously, but um, I just need to, to get more data, uh, more surveys, and uh, yeah, so that's why I'm working on networking and looking for uh, experts uh, from um, other, other countries. And also, of course, I, I, I also want to find um, some materials and some, uh, some real data from China. It's also very interesting. Uh, Chinese experience uh, um, in terms of uh, the, the legislation or foreign agents or its analogs. I think it's also 
quite different from, from, from Russian, but I think also very important to, to analyze and, again, to, to build the whole picture. Right here. Uh, I'm Natalia Shulga, I represent Aspen Institute, Global Science Pillar and Science and Society Program. Uh, I just wonder uh, if you use in your research the previous uh, Russian simulacre or sort of legislation in, from the 30s, uh, which were going after intellectuals and other enemy of the people, so now it's a foreign agents or whatever, in your study, did you find any parallels or uh, copy-pasting or anything else? It's the first part of the question. A second, do you envision that your research in the future might help to cancel those type of laws or at least kind of modify them and bring to the real legal system, not a uh, parallel or I, I cannot find a word for that because I don't want to be insulted to the person who is attorney at law. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for, for, for both questions. Um, so um, of course as a, a part of my research uh, I'm looking for some background information, background historical facts, but not only uh, from you know Soviet times, because as I mentioned in my previous um, seminar, previous presentation, I found very interesting monograph on uh, public organizations from the uh, second part of the 19th century and uh, first 20 years of 20th century in Russian Empire, how these public organizations were uh, working and uh, the reaction the, of the officials, uh, Russian officials, towards these public organizations. So you can see literally very, very uh, copy-paste phrases, you know, so. Uh, and if we look at, for example, Russian nationalist philosopher Ivan Alien's works, so we also can find a lot of interesting things about foreign influence, about uh, some uh, um, negative impact, foreign negative impact, and, uh, well, rhetoric, aggressive rhetoric towards um, for an ideology or something like that. So, of course, I uh, definitely will collect this information, and I already, uh, I'm already collecting some, uh, some data. Um, and I, I, I think, yeah, so, but my point is we should not uh, look only at Soviet times and Soviet experience, because I think that the roots of such kind of legislation much deeper, and we should dig deep to understand, you know, the the, the very the very idea of of um, of this legislation and these concerns, this you know, these threats, especially uh, uh, especially uh, amid the, the the globalization process, because of course we can say like you know, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, likes to use uh, history and all these historical narratives. Uh, disinformation, facts, conspiracy theories, and something like that. And now he, he, he literally believes that uh, Ukraine never exists and so on and so forth. That's, but again, I mean that it should not give any arguments. So if, for example, Soviet Union had this law, we also should enact this kind of legislation because it's obvious, why not? Because you know, time is differing right now. So I think that we should use this, this uh, uh, facts, historical facts for understanding of the development of these ideas. It raises a lot of question, by the way, on sovereignty, on uh, influence itself, interaction, diplomacy, human rights, um, the, uh, the activity of non-governmental organizations funded or funding from abroad also. It's very interesting the, you know, the, the status, the legal status of these organizations. And uh, the, um, I would say, um, 
yeah, I think I, I think there are a lot of there, there are a lot of interesting questions um, connected with this with this legislation. And uh, about the second question, my very idea is this research or work of my colleagues, for example, from ICNL uh, organization here in the United States or other uh, lawyers, human rights defenders in Russia from non-governmental organizations in Georgia and other countries of the world. We should try our best to um, make it, you know, transparent these issues with this legislation and of course try to help to improve this legislation because my research I don't want you know to do it only as a um, you know theoretical work or something I want to prepare a kind of a uh, maybe not a roadmap but something like that something helpful for decision makers and policy makers Maria Kanevska, human rights attorney from Russia. I have a question. Um, uh, you, of course, you know, Maxim, that um, there is another um, uh, list of uh, people affiliated with foreign agent. And according to the data of Ministry of Justice, they um, put there uh, 861 people. Can you please tell uh, for audience about this list and do you know any um, positive practice that people went to the court and won uh, cases um, against um, them being there? Because this is much more unclear uh, list. Yes, this is, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marie, for this question. It's, you know, a kind of a mystery. It's a misty list because literally this is this this is a, a, a misty list. According to the current Russian law on foreign agents, um, Russian authorities uh, have a separate list of those who are affiliated with foreign agents. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is not a public list. And even more, you cannot know if you include it in this list or not. And of course, uh, people don't want, you know, to submit some questions to the Ministry of Justice. Can you please tell me, I am I in this list or not? Because, you know, it's quite risky for them. So that's why the answer here is that I don't think that we have legal practice uh, especially positive legal practice in this sense, because I don't think that people want, you know, to to go to the Ministry of Justice and ask for for that, because the situation can be that Ministry of Justice said, well, yes, now you are in this list. So why you are asking for that? Because you have some thoughts about that. So you think that you may be included in this list? Okay, it's your choice. We can we can include you. No problem at all. Why not? Uh, and and I don't. In fact, I don't even uh, understand to uh, to the full extent uh, the very idea of this of this list. I have some thoughts about that. I think that. In general sense, we think about the foreign agent list and the foreign agent legislation as a kind of a, um, tool of stigmatization. So it means that um, authorities try to show to the broader audience, to the population, for example, for the Russian population, that these people or entities are not reliable, trustworthy, and so on and so forth. But to some extent, I think that this is, well, maybe a wrong way of thinking. Maybe their goal, I mean the goal of the Russian authorities to create a special list for the, you know, for the internal uh, inner circle, I mean for the uh, governmental organizations, pro-governmental organizations, to show them that you should not interact with this person, with these citizens, with these non-governmental organizations, and so on and so forth. Because, uh, because, for example, according to surveys from Levada Center, non-governmental sociological organization in Russia, from the very beginning of the implementation of this law in 2012, and until, I think, until the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the vast majority of people 
Russian people don't even know nothing about anything about, you know, the Russian uh, practice of implementation of this law, and they don't even care about, didn't even care about, you know, this, this status. So who cares? So I think that maybe this is the point, and the list of uh, so-called affiliated persons definitely should work um, for for this purpose because it's it again I think it's obvious if, if this list is not public so why they need this list they need it for themselves they need to know maybe a kind of a level or percentage or amount of people who are again not um, trustworthy not reliable and, and so on and so forth so it's really interesting it's really interesting part of this legislation um, and uh, I think maybe uh, one day someone will try to challenge you know this this uh, this decisions and it's yeah it's uh, that's why I call it you know the misty misty list right here um two questions is there as far as foreign uh ownership or contribution is there like a one drop rule or is there a fixed limit that you know two percent of your budget comes from a foreign source and do you have any evidence as to whether this has been used toward countries that are actually russia's allies like chinese or is it purely western countries you can receive. First of all, of course, thank you for uh, for this question because it's, it's it's also very helpful to clarify the the whole picture of the implementation and the very nature of this law. Uh, you can uh, receive uh, one dollar, and this is enough to be labeled as foreign agent in Russia, or even one cent. It in fact you you uh, you can. Um, you uh, can be um, without any foreign funding at all. Your, the, the idea of the current version of the law that you should be under the foreign influence. What does it mean, you know, if under the foreign influence? For example, you can uh, talk to independent journalists um, from other countries and you can help them as Russian Ministry of Justice uh, thinks about it, t you can help them to create a material, you know, a, 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 an article, for example. So you contribute to the article. That's why you are a foreign agent, because you are un, uh, under the uh, foreign influence. It's, 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 it's just, it's, it sounds ridiculous, I understand. But again, this is the, this is the, the logic of uh, Russian, Russian authorities. Uh, you can, again, you can uh, participate in events like, like this one. It's also a sign that you are uh, under uh, the foreign influence. You can share foreign, again, foreign views and values and agendas and this is also a sign that you are under the foreign influence. Um, and the uh, the second question, what was the second? The second question is: Is Russia influencing these other? Countries? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's um, I, I can I cannot say for sure, but I don't think so. I think that uh, all rhetoric, all draft laws, all comments. Uh, from the, the official uh, Russian authorities and Russian officials uh, are against uh, so-called collective collective West. So it's uh, that's why I think that they don't just they just don't want you know to make uh, bad uh, relationships with uh, other countries from so let's say from the East. China or, or, or other countries, because for them, Western countries, collective West, this is the real threat, the real enemy. So that's why sympathizers of so-called collective West are foreign agents. Time for one last question. If someone has a burning question, if not, I want to thank Maxime for an excellent presentation and thank you all for coming. Thank you so much.